Hello and welcome to The Gathering Church. My name is John Mark Redwine and I am the lead pastor. This is Eleanor, that was Dagny, and we're just so honored to have you guys with us today. Thank you for joining us, whether you're joining us in a gather home or online. Go ahead, baby, say hi. Hi. <laughs> Our family has had a great time away over the last couple weeks, but we are so happy to be back with you today. And so uh, I, I'm just so excited to be joining you. I'm joining you from my backyard uh, as a precaution since we traveled. We're quarantining to be safe. Well, today is going to be a Vision Sunday. I want to take time to talk a little bit about who we are as a church in this season. And I want to talk for a few minutes about our plan for August and our current strategy going forward. Here's what I know. Life as we knew it has been turned upside down now for four months, and it feels like longer. We don't know how long this is going to last, and we don't know what life is going to look like on the other side. As a result, we are all feeling unsettled and uncomfortable. As a church, we've been feeling this way too. In the beginning, we took this kind of like bad weather. We'll readjust for now with the hope that it's temporary and things will get back to normal soon. But the longer it went on, the more clear it became that this is not just a crisis season. It's a year of crisis. Things have changed not just in a short term of a couple weeks, but in the long term. We could still be dealing with this well into next year. So it's time to stop waiting on things to settle back into what they were, and it's time to readjust. This is true for us as individuals and it's true for us as a church. But this is not the first time the church has had to readjust. This is also not the worst global season the church has had to endure. Today in China and across the Middle East, churches have to operate in secret. Just a few decades ago, churches all across Europe had to endure a global war for six years that was fought in their own hometowns. Only two decades before that, a similar war was fought right out on their doorsteps. If we look further back, we see the church having to readjust for the impacts of wars, famines, revolutions, disease outbreaks, and many, many other crises in our 2,000 year history as the church. In each season, the church has persisted through these crises as a means of support for our cities and hope for our hearts, despite the fact that they've done, the way that they've done it has had to change. We've spent a lot of time in prayer and under wise counsel about how we are called to readjust in this season for as long as it carries on. And the question I keep asking is what does the church need to be now? What does God require of us and what do our neighbors need from us? Let me tell you three things the church is in every season and what that means for you. First, we are hope dealers. We are living in a vacuum of hope right now. It's really hard to find hope to hold on to when the target keeps moving. We don't know where the light is at the end of the tunnel. No one agrees on when this pandemic will end or how it will end. There's a million other problems on top of the pandemic or caused by it that are also cycling through our news feeds. There's recession, poverty, political unrest, and every other kind of unrest you can think of. It's bad out there. We are living in a hope vacuum right now. And here's what's happening. In this season of extreme pressure and stress and isolation, people are finding more and more things to channel their frustration at. The government, each other, policies, ideas, everything has become a battleground. The world is scary right now and people are scared and when people are scared, they are not themselves. And Christians, we've been a part of it. Within our own churches, we're fighting with one another. We're turning our frustration in at one another. And in this hope vacuum, it feels like the only feeling we have that is consistent is our frustration. So it's making us petty, 
mean, irritable, judgmental, and angry. That is not who we are. Church, in every season, despite the condition of the world around us, we are hope dealers. We bring the world the hope of the world. Jesus said to us in Matthew 5, 14, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. The light he's talking about is the hope that we have and the hope we were created to share. We are dealers of hope in hopeless seasons. And we are the ones, as followers of Jesus, responsible for bringing that hope to others. Paul modeled this to the early church. Paul experienced hardship and persecution at a level you and I cannot even grasp. His world was hostile, dangerous, and often lonely. But he was a constant source of hope and joy to the cities he did ministry in and the people that he led. In Romans 15, 13, he says as he closes this letter, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul prays, that over the, prays this prayer over the Roman church as it's torn apart by divisiveness between Jewish Christians and Roman Christians as they are persecuted by three different groups of people in a world with no antibiotics or no anesthesia. He prays hope over them because hope doesn't come from our circumstances, it comes from our source. And our source is the Holy Spirit. As the church, we serve the God of hope and through the power of His Holy Spirit, His hope is available to us in this season and in every season. No matter what happens in the world around us, we still have hope. As David says from one of the darkest seasons of his life in Psalm 39, as he talks about how people desperately search for something to put their hope in, in Psalm 39, 7, he says, But now, Lord, what do I look for? For my hope is in you. My hope is in you. Our hope is not in the circumstances of our country or our city or our finances or our comfort. Our hope is in Jesus and the gift of eternal life that He has given us. No matter what the world around us looks like, as followers of Jesus, we have hope to offer those around us because our hope is not in this world or from this world. Our hope is consistent and it is in a joy that is to come. It's time for us to stop living like the rest of the world in this season. Philippians 3 says, Our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him to subject all things to Himself. See, our hope is in Jesus and the promises He's made us about the future we face. So let's no longer be a part of this cycle of frustration the world is caught in. As the church, we are hope dealers. We have what the rest of the world desperately needs, hope. We offer hope in Jesus. We know that no matter what happens in this life, we have hope for the next one because Jesus died to give us that hope. We offer hope in the story. Because of the gift of the scriptures, we can look back at the story of humanity with all of its ups and downs and say with confidence that God is telling a bigger story than the moment we are in. And He's already written the ending and the ending is good. So we can offer hope in the story that is being written right now that He works all things together for the good of those who love Him. We offer hope in one another. Throughout the Bible, God uses imperfect people from all different backgrounds to create communities of peace for His people. In a season where people are tearing one another apart, it is our responsibility to unite and care for each other in a way that brings hope to the world around us. 
in this season and in every season, we are hope dealers. Let me encourage you to take inventory of your words in this season. Are there more words of hope or more words of division? James 1 warns us about the power of our tongues and how important it is to choose our words carefully. And Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So church, speak life. Speak hope. Be a hope dealer to the people around you. They need that from us now more than ever. We are hope dealers. And that's not all. We are gospel bringers. If we are hope dealers, make no mistake about it, the hope we have to give is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. You were created with a purpose. And that purpose is nuanced to who you are and how you were created and the gifts and talents as you have. And it's written specifically for you. But for every purpose and every person, even though the how may be different, the what is always the same. You were created to glorify God and serve others. And the number one way you can do that is to share the life-changing message of Jesus with anybody that you can. And Jesus said it this way, Mark 16, 15, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now here's an area where we need to readjust. Because until now, I would have told you the most effective way for us to do this was to invite people to our Sunday services. At the gathering, we work hard to make Sundays the best place for someone to enter into a new relationship with Jesus. If you've never been to a Sunday gathering, I want to tell you, we create a warm, welcoming environment where people will be able to belong before they believe. We give them the opportunity to see what it's like to be a part of this family. Walking into the gathering church on a Sunday morning feels like coming home to somewhere you were always meant to be. And through a combination of seeing how following Jesus has changed the person who invited them's life, from the combination of being invited into the space and the way that you make Sundays happen on our dream team, we have seen dozens of people enter new life in Jesus as a result of this model. But things are different now. Our Sundays are looking a little bit different. So what do we as the church need to do to continue to be gospel bring us? Luckily, this isn't the first time the church has been forced to change how we do this. Paul knew his calling. It was clear to him he was called to bring the message of Jesus to anyone that he could. Sometimes that means communicating God's good news to thousands, like in Acts 17, when he would go to the amphitheater in Athens, Greece, and share this message of Jesus. Or in the many churches he would start in places like Corinth, Ephesus, and Philippi. But sometimes Paul's audience was different. Some seasons he lived his purpose out on a grand scale at the top of his potential, and sometimes he lived it out on a smaller scale at the top of what was possible. More than once Paul was arrested for doing what, for what, for doing what he was called to do. Look at how he opens his letter to the Philippians. He wrote this letter during a long stint in prison awaiting a trial and possibly his death. Philippians 1.12 says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that my circumstances have actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Paul was in a situation where he couldn't go where he wanted and do the things he wanted to do and do them the way he wanted to do them. But Paul knew he was still called. And his circumstances may not have advanced the gospel the way he would have chosen, but they still advanced the gospel. His captors got to hear his heart for Jesus. Here's my point. You may not be able to serve your purpose on the dream team or with us on Sunday mornings, but you are still called to serve in your purpose. And your purpose is to be a gospel bringer. So who can you bring the gospel to in this season? Who's your captive audience? Is it a family member? Is it a neighbor? Is it a coworker? Is it your Amazon delivery driver? It's not that hard. You just share your story with people. Create an opportunity to do so. Take a conversation deeper and do it unapologetically. Hey man, how are you really doing in this season? It's been hard for me, but 
I still have hope. Can I share with you why I have hope and how it's changed my life? You can share the link for these services with them. You can invite them to your gather home or life group. Make sure that whoever you have access to knows that you are in chains for Christ. Make sure that whoever that is knows why you are a hope dealer. And finally, we are hope dealers, gospel bringers, and we are community creators. If all this time apart, has taught us anything, it's how much we need to be with one another. If you can't already feel that from just a desire to be back with your people, you can see it playing out on your newsfeed. When all people are is boiled down to social media opinions, it gets nasty out there. We forget that the person behind the keyboard is a person who's going through things, who's been through things, who has value, who needs to feel loved, and who needs to feel Seen when we're apart and only able to connect digitally, we are not connecting in the most important ways and it's causing division and fighting and bitterness like I have never seen before. Church, we are called to be community creators. I love Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. He says, because we love you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because effective ministry is both and our lives, and the gospel. That's what we share with people. And guys, we need each other, now more than ever. C.S. Lewis, the famed author and theologian, was familiar with pain in seasons that don't make sense. He fought in World War I, a war that claimed 25 million lives. During the war, he was badly injured and his two closest friends were killed by friendly fire. And he said this, I'm not sure God wants us to be happy. I think He wants us to love and be loved. But we're like children, thinking our toys will make us happy and the whole world is our nursery. Something must drive us out of that nursery and into the lives of others. And that something is suffering. Let's let this season of suffering be one that drives us into greater community, whatever that looks like, instead of away from it. It's time for us as the church to create community again. So let me walk you through some updates on what's coming and how you can be involved. First, let me just say this. We do not know when it will be safe or possible for us to meet again. I know that everyone has different opinions about this, but with changing information constantly, I've just got no way to predict it. Our hope was to begin meeting in some way a few weeks ago for Thursday night recordings, but then case counts went up and now we've scaled that back. Here's what I can tell you. At this time, we have no place to meet on Sundays and we don't have a good option. The high school we meet in, T.C. Robertson, cannot allow outside events in as long as they are in Plan B. I do not expect to be back in T.C. Robertson in 2020. That could change, but today that's what it looks like. We've looked at a few other options, but we're just not in a hurry. Our priority right now is being financially responsible during this huge economic crisis and to prioritize our funds on our community's needs rather than overhead costs. Here's what we are going to do. We're going to continue to create community through life groups. The Gathering Church existed for eight months with no Sunday services. During that time, we just had life groups. And it was an amazing season of ministry, life change, and genuine community. I believe that the season we are entering into for this fall will be a season like that as well. Life groups are able to meet with smaller capacities and we will be encouraging our leaders to take as many precautions as they can, such as meeting outside in the yard when it's possible, or if they're inside wearing masks and sanitizing spaces before and after. And with these precautions, I believe we can create excellent environments for you to be in community again. And I believe that is what people need for us to be right now, community creators. I think this is so important because what people really need is just to be seen. We need to be seen. We crave it. 
And I think right now so many people don't feel like anyone sees them. At the gathering, we see one another. When you go to a life group and sit down in somebody's deck or backyard, you get to say out loud what you've been going through. And as a community of people full of different experiences and wisdoms, you get to figure it out together how to get through it. If you're still not sure uh, you feel safe about being around people, we fully understand and respect that. That's why we've made it an option to lead Zoom groups as well. Leading a life group has never been easier. Just sign up. You don't have to be qualified. You sure as heck don't have to be perfect. Just be available. Let's be community creators. I'm also excited to tell you today that on August 2nd, we will begin 21 days of prayer. It's time to commit ourselves in prayer. 21 days of prayer is a special time every January and August that we set aside and dedicate to God. Join us in committing to pray every single day for 21 days. We'll kick it off next Sunday with worship and then Monday through Friday you can join us online at live.gatherashville.org or a social media platform, one of ours, for a quick prayer prompting at 6.45 a.m. that lasts for 15 minutes. Saturdays, we will have prayer services at Seacoast Church. We'll update you before the 8th on whether those can be open to the public or not, but either way, they will be streamed. Commit to join us in prayer during this season. Pastor Mitch reminded us last week how vital it is that we stay connected in the vine during this season. Connect with God in prayer and it will change everything. I believe you can experience growth in this season unlike any other before it. But I believe that the key to that growth is prayer. Our ability to produce fruit is directly connected to our prayer life. Let's get back on track together. The last update that I want to give you is about serve days. We, we are getting ready to begin to think through some ways we can serve you as we step into month five since the lockdown began. Every serve day is going to take place right after Saturday morning prayer at Seacoast Asheville. The first serve day is going to be on Saturday, August 8th, and it's a grocery giveaway. Here's the plan. Thanks to your generosity, we're putting together around 200 bags of groceries to give away. These will be one bag with a meal and a couple of staples. We want you to help us serve our city by thinking about two to three people you could bless with some groceries. We'll give you the groceries, you just drop off the bags. You can do it in secret or you can have a cameraman present like the Publishers Clearinghouse. Your call. We just want to bless people. So go ahead and go on our website where you can sign up and tell us how many bags you need and get in mind who you're going to bring those bags to. And listen, if you're in a season right now where you need a bag of groceries, just add it to the amount of bags you're going to give away. Nobody will know and we want to be able to bless you in this season as well. Pickups are going to be minimal contact from your car in a drive through we're setting up in the Seacoast parking lot at 123 Sweeten Creek Road beginning at 10.30 a.m. on Saturday, August 8th. I think we're only doing about 200 bags, so sign up now. And you, no limit, as many bags as you want, but sign up now and make sure that you have a home for each of those bags to go to. The next thing that we want to do is we miss you and we want to buy you lunch. We just want to bless you with some Christian chicken. And so we're going to be putting together catering boxes of about 200 meals from Chick-fil-A. We're going to be handing these out the next Saturday after the 8th, after our prayer service, around starting at about 11 a.m. You can come through this drive through that we're setting up, and we'll uh, hand you a box with a meal in it. All you have to do is sign up, let us know how many meals you need, and we will bless you with a lunch. Then on the final Saturday of August, we want to do a serve day just to bless our church. It's been a hard season. Maybe you've got some deferred maintenance around your house. Maybe you're, you got weeds growing up out of all the beds. Maybe you got a mess that needs to get cleaned up. Or maybe it's something else along those lines. We want you to send us your small projects. And we want to send teams of two to three to go work on them for you. 
Everyone will be temperature checked. We'll be as careful as we can. We just want to get out and serve you. So if you want to do that, you can sign up for a project that you want people to come help you with, or you can sign up to serve on our website beginning next week. I am so excited for this season of our church. I believe that even in these times, there is so much good we can do. And just like in times in the past, it is the church that remains consistent. When or how or what may look different, but our why never changes. We are the church. We are hope dealers, gospel bringers, and community creators, and we are exactly what the world needs right now. So let's go and be it. If you're here today and you want some of that hope, you want to feel that hope, you, you're, you're in need of, of, of the hope that Jesus offers, let me just tell you that right now you can enter into a relationship with Jesus and you don't have to do anything to get ready for it. You don't have to meet any specific requirements. All you have to do is say yes to the gift He's already offered you. If that's you, would you just pray this prayer with me right now? Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for the gift that you gave me, for the hope that you offer me. And Father, I ask that you would forgive me for trying to do this on my own for so long, that, that God, you would, you would forgive me for all of my mistakes and all of my sins. And today I, I declare that I believe in you, that I need you, that I want you, and I surrender all that I am to you. I love you and I pursue you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, this is the time in our service when we respond. There's a few different ways to respond. You can go online to our website right now and go sign up to lead a life group. We, we need to create community. And in order to do that, we need people to lead life groups. Please help us in this way. Go sign up to lead a life group right now. You could fill out a connect card and let us know about a decision you made to follow Jesus so that we can give you your next steps. You could go online and fill out a connect card. Let us know the prayer request you have so our prayer team can be lifting you up in prayer or you could partner with us in giving. We really believe that giving is worship. And when you give to the local church, you're sowing directly into the kingdom of God, into meeting the spiritual needs and the physical needs in our city. And we also believe that by giving to the church, we're, we're saying that God has the number one seed in our hearts, the number one seed in our lives, and all of our trust and our hope is in Him. And so if you're a part of this family, we invite you to partner with us in that way. Well, we're just so honored that you've worshiped with us here today. Let me pray for us as we close and worship one more time. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are good, that no matter what you are good, that you are consistent, that the promises you have for us remain no matter what changes around us. We honor you today. We worship you today. We pursue you today and we offer your hope to those around us today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us today.